whole fleet of them, look on the ASA. My gosh, they're all going against the wind. It was basically a cube with inside of a sphere where the points of the cube uh, were touching outside of the sphere. So this isn't anything that just is limited to the United States. It's a worldwide phenomenon. That UFO podcast is powered by Zencaster. Zencaster is one of the world's leading platforms for recording and hosting podcasts. Zencaster is a modern web-based solution for high-quality audio and video podcast production. With a full suite of professional tools, Zencaster allows podcasters to quickly and seamlessly record their guests remotely and produce their podcasts in studio quality. Check out the links in the show description to find out more. Hi, this is Mark O'Connell, and you're listening to That UFO Podcast. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to That UFO Podcast. My name is Andy, and really looking forward to kicking off uh, with someone I've heard talk a couple of times in various different interviews over the last year or so. Um, It's Laurie Rayfelt, who was stationed at RAF Bentwaters and Woodbridge, bases that may sound familiar as they're synonymous with uh, the Rendlesham Forest Incident. Uh, Laurie, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I, I'm so happy to, to be here. Yeah, it's so, good to have you on. Um, and listen, before we get to talking about y- your time you spent at RAF Bentwaters in Woodbridge, um, I want to find out a little bit about your background and what got you to the, to the military uh, in the first place. Um, so what was your kind of background growing up? Um, well, I grew up on Long Island, New York, and in uh, I grew up near the beaches, and it was really, I had a great childhood, but mom and dad got divorced in 74 or so. And so money got tight. And when 1977, I was supposed to go to the School of Visual Arts in New York City. I was going to major in film studies. And I got there, I got to New York City, and it turned out that the uh, school did not have dormitories. So logistically, it was not, it was looking almost impossible to, to go there. And New York City for me at the time was pretty intimidating. So I wasn't, so it was, it was just a hard decision. And so my mom decided since we were in New York City, why not go to the Statue of Liberty? <laughs> it's like, well, let's make a day of it. And I, I mean, in my mind, I was thinking, what am I going to do with my life? What am I going to do? And I'm on the, I'm on the uh, ferry, and I started thinking back at this young woman in my English class in high school who had all these brochures of the military. And I remember her thumbing through the brochures of the Air Force. And I, I thought, well, that looks pretty good. Maybe I should check it out. So, uh, so I, that's what I did the following day. I actually called up the recruiting office and wanted to say, you know, check it out. We'll see what it's about. So that was the beginning of my Air Force career. Now, I find that interesting. You've said you found New York City intimidating. 
But mm-hmm. for, for a young woman in the, the late 70s applying to, to join the military, was that not quite intimidating as well? Because times have changed in 2021, mm-hmm. but that was it was very much male dominated, wasn't it at the time? Yeah, I, and of course I didn't know that. It was five percent of the or less of the women in, who were active duty were, um, yeah, small amount. And yeah, going into the military, the reason it made more sense to me is that they were going to pay me, they were going to give me a place to sleep, give me shelter, give, you know, just take care of me. You know, I didn't have to pay for I didn't have to pay for anything out of pocket. So that kind of makes sense. And I went to a school called St. Patrick's School, an elementary school, where back in the day, we actually had nuns for teachers, and some of them were pretty tough. And I figured if I could handle the nuns at St. Patrick's School, I can pretty much handle anything. Uh, So, yeah, I, I really didn't think that far ahead, because we didn't have any military bases on Long Island that I was aware of at the time. And so it was all new to me. What were those early days like on the on the bases? So we're talking here late 70s that you actually arrive at Bentwaters, yeah? I arrived at Bentwaters. Well, I, I started basic training on January 23rd, 1978. Fast forward five months later, roughly, I was over at RAF Bentwaters. I mean, my basic training and my technical school were were about five, six weeks each. So I got to Bent Waters on about May 3rd, 1978. And yeah, it was a it was a real shock. Getting there, it was nothing like basic training or technical school with all they, they had great food there. They, you know, I just got to Bentwaters and it was uh, it, the facilities were pretty non-existent. I mean, they had a gym, gymnasium and a movie theater, movie theater, two lane bowling alley. I, I mean, for a young airman, it was what most of them ended up doing was spending their money at the class six store, which was the, where you buy the alcohol and, you know, in the next two years, you know, when you were off duty drinking, you know, that seemed to be, you know, at the time what, what the Air Force did quite a bit. Uh, so, yeah, it was, um, you know, it was, it was just really interesting that way. Getting to Bent Waters, I was so excited when I first learned that I was going to England and it was a Royal Air Force. So I thought, I was expecting to see almost everything with gold and, you know, gilded. And yeah. I, I had, I had no idea. And so when I got there and I saw the green Quonset huts with the pot belly stoves in it, and it, I was just really blown away about how I felt as if I, I went back to world war two. I mean, everything just seemed like I, I went back in time. And it wasn't a good feeling. So, and then at that point, too, when the bus drove through uh, the main gate, that was the first time I got to see a a gate guard. And that would be one of my jobs because I was going into, I was in law enforcement. And I uh, was uh, thinking, okay, well, that's one of the jobs I'll be doing, but hopefully I'll get to do something interesting. And because I was still, eager and couldn't wait to start working and I um, got off the bus and the first thing my sponsor said to me was welcome to Cripple Creek oh my god Cripple Creek what do you mean Cripple Creek (laughs) oh no and on top of it I started to feel physically start to feel this heaviness over me like a heavy weight over me and I couldn't it was almost a depressed kind of a feeling, but it was it was more physical, not uh, psychological. And I, I was just thinking, you know, there's some, something wrong with this place. I mean, that was a fleeting thought. Something, something's not right about this place. Not only is it going back to World War II, it was just that something was just completely off about the place. 
Now, we're now talking the, the late 70s, and of course, the famous Rendlesham incident happened in, in 1980. Were you around the base at that time? Actually, I had left the base December 15th of 1980, so I, I was not there for a Rendlesham uh, incident. Technically, my order said December 26th, and I was so mad I wanted to go home that I said, fine, I'm, I'm flying out commercial. I just wanted to get out of there. I, I really, I felt as if I was in the war zone there and I just wanted to get out of there. I, I didn't have, a lot of people had really good experiences there. I, I had my share of good experiences, but for the most part, when it came to the base, um, I just had to get, I had to get out of there. Well, what was your first experience then on the base in terms of ha- any high strangeness events? Because we're not just talking, you know, UFO sightings. There's There's been many things happened over your time there, hasn't there? Yes, yes. Well, I'd have to say, first of all, the, the experience of the heaviness over me, I, you know, it felt as if somebody decided to put on a, like 40, 50 pounds on me that I had to carry with me. And it was really messing up my stamina. I, I was having, I started to slowly start having problems with um, just getting the energy to, to do my job. And, it, and that was kind of frightening because I was only 18 when I got there. I was pretty young. And then it, it took, a, once I got there, people were telling us that we were in the most haunted county in, in the world. And there were all these stories of Druids and East End Charlie, uh, a World War II pilot who lost his head and walks the runway and scares people. And it, it was just a lot of, uh, you know, scary stories going on. And, you know, I tried to take it, mm, well, you know, I didn't want to get scared. So I would take it for, you know, for what it was worth. And so pretty much I just kind of did what I did with everything. I just pushed it out of my mind. And then the, um, a lot of the guys that I was working with being one of one of few women, I mean, there were about, I'd say 20 active duty, 20, 30 active duty women on the whole base that were single, the single ones, the ones that were married, that they, they lived off base. Uh, so the percentage, I think it was like five, five or 10 women tops that were working in, security police, the 81st security police. So when I was on flight, I was usually the only woman on flight with the men. And it was just kind of hearing a lot of sexist kind of talk. People telling me I should be barefoot and pregnant. And, and, you know, it was just not really conducive to to say, well, let's – Let's put Lori under our wing and, and teach her how to be a really good security police person. Um, Can I just ask, Lori? Did, sure. did you? And again, people have to remember this was this was nineteen eighty. Did you expect that treatment at the time? Was it was it what you expected? Was it worse or was it was it better for for lack of a better word? Well, when I when I first got there, I'm talking nineteen seventy eight. It was. It, it was it was harder. I mean, for, for women, for me, uh, I I seemed to I felt like I was under the magnifying glass. Mm-hmm. And on top of it, the squadron commander, Major Ziegler, at the time, he did not like women in in the career field. So it's really tough when you have the squadron commander, you know, looking at you like you're you know, a piece of garbage or whatever. And it was just the whole thing was just completely disheartening. I did have a few, a few good um, sergeants who I, who I did look up to. Uh, my first flight chief was uh, David Richard and I looked up to him and then, but he left immediately and then I was stuck with some really um, not so good supervisors. And then, and then there was a, Dan, Dan Kaler, he was a really good flight chief. So I did have my handful of, you know, good sergeants to look up to. And so, so all in all, on that way, so I, so there were two things, as you can tell, two themes going on. One theme was trying to 
integrate in a squadron that really didn't want me because I was a woman. The second was soon to be a lot of the paranormal and the, uh, the UFO sighting because one really, really piggybacked on the other because if I see a UFO or if I see something and I report it, it's, it's again, it, it's a put down to say, oh, I felt seeing UFOs. And, and, and I was pretty, um, at that time, I would say what made me different than a lot of the, a lot of the guys was the fact that I was very, very sensitive. Um, not that I would cry or anything like that. My, my sensitivity was I could pick things up. I could read people um, pretty well. I can, I can see if somebody hated my guts. It was, <laughs> the body language was pretty obvious. And, uh, you know, so, but I also took responsibility for how they reacted to me. And that was not really the best. For instance, uh, my s- sergeant had a, it was in the winter time and I had lent my gloves to one of the airmen on another flight and he forgot to give me the gloves back. So my hands are turning red from the cold as I'm standing on the main gate and my supervisor drives up in a hot, you know, in a warm pickup patrol vehicle. And he looks at me and says, where are your gloves? And he's got his gloves on and he, uh, he just asked me, where are your gloves? And I said, oh, I lent them to Rick and, you know, I didn't get them back. And I was thinking that he was going to take his gloves off and said, well, here, you, you can use these. Uh, but he just kind of looked at me and nodded, you know, like, oh, you know, you're screwed. Your hands are going to be cold for the rest of the night. And so he took off. About an hour later, the wing commander, the highest ranking uh, person on base, he was a full, full bird colonel. He came on the base. And he looked at my hands and he said the same thing. Where are your gloves? And I told him and he said, here, take my gloves. I said, oh, sir, no, I, I can't do that. You know? And he said, no, um, he said it kind of with a smile on his face. He said, this is an order. And I said, okay, sir. So it was pilot gloves. So I was like, when I got my first break, I went up to the law enforcement desk to show everybody I was wearing pilot gloves. Like, look at me, you know. And everyone kind of thought that was really, you know, oh, wow, it was pretty cool. But then the next morning, all of a sudden, there's a banging on my door of my dormitory. Bam, bam, bam. I'm like, what's going on? You know, I'm talking through the door. And they said, Ray felt you got to go down and see the commander, meaning Major Zickler. For what? He said something about you going up the chain of command and and, and making Colonel Wacker uh, give give you the gloves. I think, what the heck? You know, that's not how it happened. And they knew it. So I I went up there and I explained what happened. I mean, this to me was such a minute situation, but it's real important to understand that these little itty bitty things that were all were blown out of proportion to the point where I I mean I you know I was getting in, in pretty big trouble. At the end of the evening, I was so angry and so frustrated. I asked another woman from the dormitory, Katie Matthews, to go with me to the command to the wing commander's house and give him back his gloves. And you know, so I did and I thanked him and I told I did tell him that I got into trouble because I was just so frustrated. And I really wanted him to know that because I felt that he would know maybe next time, don't don't give any of us your gloves because we're going to get in trouble for jumping the chain of command. That, that was the key to it. Why did I go to the very, very top of the chain of command? It's like, I thought, yeah, well, that's the way to do it. You know, you need gloves. Why go to just anyone when I can go to the king? You know, I was like, no, no. So anyway, that, that, those were the types of things that I had to deal with, you know, quite often. So, so I, can, I can see how any and probably gives a wonderful piece of context that that something so small and trivial uh, as being loaned someone's gloves never even asking for them turns mm-hmm. into something much much bigger and of course as we can all imagine from watching the movies and tv shows that you then have consequences and repercussions as to what your duties may be and how your the treatment you get afterwards as well can mm-hmm. all have be a massive impact on the back of what happens so 
that's obviously as we're going to discuss some of these more paranormal and the ufo based yes. event and it's just to remember for the listeners that off the back of you know what you do or do not say can have a huge impact on your life on the base going forward let alone you know what you encounter was your initial um event that happened to do with the paranormal or was it the ufo event that came first uh the paranormal came first what the, were some uh, of those initial events then laurie well one of them and it was about it was almost about six months after i'd been on the bay so now it's the winter it's 1979 and i was on patrol i got pretty pretty good at it uh, so I was on, I was either a gate guard or I was on patrol working swing shift and mid, midnight shifts. So this is during a swing shift, meaning from four o'clock to 12 o'clock in, in, in the evening. And it was still daylight. And I had to check this one. We, we have a check sheet. So on the check sheet, we have to go to these buildings and check to make sure that they're locked up. And one of the one of the places we had to go to was the was the um, liquid oxygen the locks uh, gate. The locks was where they they had the liquid oxygen that they would use with the aircraft. And so I, my job was just to go up to the fence and check the lock and go back. But the the road this was near we called it Ivy Lodge Gate. It, it was it was a side gate on RF Bound Waters. Uh, the gate and the going to the locks on the left side was a fence that would lead off base. So if you jumped the fence, you would be off base. And or if you were smart and you went to the gate, you can just go through the gate if, if the gate's open. So I uh, I pulled up and. And on the gate, on the fence, was a lot of ivy. There was a lot of overgrowth. And so I couldn't see through the fence. But in my mind, now, now this is some of the things that you're going to hear about that are more of the sixth sense coming out. It, it's not through my eyes or ears or, or whatnot. There are some things that I'm going to tell you about that I did physically see with my eyes and my, my ears, but... Something told me that in my gut said that there was a pond on the other side of the fence. And I mean, I could almost see it. And in my, again, in my mind, and it wasn't just to let you know, it wasn't until many, many years later, I was on Google maps because I was kind of curious to see is, was there a pond or water on the other side? Yes, there was. So now I can corroborate it with my other senses to say what I was feeling there was 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 right on. The I felt like all of a sudden when I was sitting in the uh, driver's side. Now we were driving actually uh, American trucks, so my my steering wheel was on the left side. So I'm um, um, I felt this deathly face I call him the crazed man he had like black hair and it was like just messed up but his face was dead white and and he was just kind of teasing me Uh, but I didn't see him he was like but he's right by my window and I just I wouldn't look because in times like that you just didn't want to be scared so I would put my car put my truck in reverse and I would get the hell out of there. And every time I went to the locks, I could feel him. And what's interesting, doing research, I did learn that not far from there was a place called Rendlesham Hall that was this huge mansion. And in at the mansion, at one point, they ended up using it for uh, people that, that had drug problems and people that were uh, problems with alcohol and that kind of thing. So I'm thinking there was a connection there with the crazed man and that kind of thing. And talking to some other researchers, there there is actually something known about this crazed man. I mean, it's not like something I made up. Apparently, you know, I was talking with Linda Moulton Howe and, and she had corroborated some of the things that what I had felt. And 
But anytime I was on patrol and I had to go check that fence, it, you know, it was just scared the heck out of me. It just, and, um, but I couldn't tell anybody either. Because if I mentioned it, next thing I know, they, they would have put me on what we call snap patrol, meaning they would take away my ribbons. I mean, my, my beret and, you know, my, my badge and everything and put me on a, uh, what they call weeds and seeds duty. So I'd be out picking up trash and that kind of thing. It was, it was something that Major Zickler had set up to pretty much humiliate people that he decided weren't competent to stay in the military. So I, I just had to suck it up. Can, so. can I just ask, Laurie, because uh, there's a few really interesting incidents you talked about there and the crazed man. And had you ever felt before you joined the military that you had any form of, you know, being intuitive or any sort of paranormal experiences in your life before that? Or was this the first time? No, I, I did. I did have it. I did have it before then. When I was in third grade, I was walking past a door of the, uh, I was going to St. Patrick's school and on the, let's see, on the left side was the church and on the left side was the all purpose room. And I looked over and I was walking in a line because they had us pretty much, we were pretty doing everything, but almost like military, you know, you just, if you were in line, you walked straight, you didn't stop. And I saw uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus. It was this really ornate, beautiful, beautiful, I thought it was a beautiful statue, very lifelike. And, and there were flowers all around the base and she was holding this huge bouquet of roses and, it was just, it was just phenomenal. And the interesting thing about that is that in that particular church, all the statues at the time looked like they carved wood that was very, very plain. So it was very different than this beautiful statue. And the statue was very, very, it was pretty big. And then I passed the second set of double doors and the statue was gone. So I remember going home and telling my mom about it. And then my mom called up my grandma, who actually lived in Ireland. And my grandma was actually, for several years, she was a nun. So she, mom just completely got it and said, Lori, Lori had a sighting. Lori, Lori saw, you know, it wasn't a statue. This is what I saw. And I'm in, you know, I'm a nine-year-old. I'm like, okay. <laughs> that's what, if that's what I saw because I couldn't find the statue anywhere. I mean, I kind of looked around whenever I was, if I saw a door open, a, a closet door, thinking how could they fit it in there? I don't know. And uh, several, a couple of years ago, I actually went back to the school and I did tell somebody, I really wanted to reach out to the principal and tell her about the sighting. And when I told the woman at the, at the door of uh, the secretary, she said, you know, people have had other experiences. They could feel the presence of Mary there. So I thought that was interesting, too. It was one of those, again, uh, being having it corroborated that, wow, so, other, you know, so I'm not alone with this. And, uh, and then the other experience I had was the house that we lived in was um, had was let me put it this way. Most of Long Island had been run. There was a real big presence of Native Americans, uh, different Indian tribes, with the Iroquois, and just a, a bunch of different Indian uh, tribes. And I truly believe that we, in fact, I grew up in a town called Nesconset. There's a Ronkonkoma down the road. So a lot of the Native American names are very much influenced on Long Island. So I was, I believe that there was a lot of bloodshed um, where our house was, or it could have been a burial site or something, but there was something evil in the, in the basement that I could actually hear. And he would laugh really, really loudly. And he did that several, several times, especially when things were going bad in the house, when my mom and dad were going through a divorce and that kind of thing. It was just, uh, just completely scary. And yeah. And so, yeah. So the house isn't there anymore. My dad actually tore the house down and built a house behind it. And ironically, 
took the old house and buried it in our old in-ground pools. So it's like the house with whatever the was going on there was there. But I still think that the history of a place has a huge influence on where where you live. And it may not be the, the history within the past 20, 30 years. It could be the history of 500 years ago or whatnot, or longer. And I think that's the same with what was going on over in Suffolk in England. I believe that the energies, energy that was there, really influenced a lot of the paranormal and also the UFO sighting. Yeah, well, let, let's talk about the UFO sighting. I just found that really interesting that you you have those intuitive senses growing up and they've, they've carried mm-hmm. on with you through like womanhood and into the military. And so, yeah, let, let's talk about that UFO sighting. Obviously, Rendlesham is famous for the Rendlesham Forest incident yeah. that we've all heard so much about. It's now been almost 41 years this December. Uh, what was your own personal UFO experience at the base? Well, I think what makes mine different than the others, and I actually call it the East Gate incident. Eastgate was probably the, the biggest place. I was at RAF Woodbridge. It was the biggest place where most of the paranormal, anything kind of bizarre, pretty much happened. Quite a bit of it happened over at RAF Woodbridge. Uh, Eastgate was butted up against the Rendlesham Forest. And at night, the forest was, was pretty foreboding. It was scary. And one night, I was on patrol. Now, this is in February of 1980. In, in February in England, as, as you probably know, it's, it stays dark long. Yeah. Dark starts around, I don't know, five in the evening and stays dark until six, seven in the morning. I mean. Yeah, easily, yeah. Yep. Yeah, England does dark really, really well. And so I was on patrol, and one of my jobs was to go out and check the gate. Uh, East Gate. At that point, we kept the gate locked. And so I I go up to the gate and check it. And then I put the car in reverse and I parked it over near East Gate, the, the, the physical gate check. And I was still facing in the direction of the North Sea. And I was sitting with a, I was on patrol with, I had a partner with me, um, Keith Duffield. And he, so, so he saw it too. And we were just sitting there talking and it was three o'clock in the morning, zero, 300 hours. And we saw this, this bright white light coming in from the, the North Sea. It looked like it was going to be a large cargo plane. I, and I thought it was kind of interesting that there was a plane landing and in the middle of the night, coming from the North Sea. So I kept looking over at, at the lights of the runway, which again was on the left, kept looking over to see the runway lights go on. They didn't go on. About maybe, I don't know, 100, 200 yards. I, it was right about where the fence line from the end of the runway, from where I was, so it wasn't that far from me, where this light then stopped. And it hovered and we didn't hear any noise. There was no sound, but it just hovered. And we were just staring at it. Like we were in shock. We thought, again, <laughs> what is this? And then it made these geometric movements and it, it went up, down, left, right, kind of in the, I, I call it the, the sign of the cross. And, and it seems like the number three keeps coming into, into place because at that point, after it did its movements, it broke into three pieces. It's like it kind of throbbed, but then it burst into three pieces and did this low arc where it went down close to the runway. So it was probably only about maybe 10, 20 feet off the ground. And these three pieces then did this arc and then flew straight up into the night sky. So kind of like we were waiting for it to come back. Thinking, well, you know, when you see something like that and you're processing it, sometimes it's like really hard to really process it because you think it's not going to end. You, you kind of think it's going to come back or do something. And 
it, it didn't come back. So, so we were sitting there thinking, what should we do? And it was pretty much I handed the radio over to Keith and I said, look, we got to report it because it flew over the base. So this is where RFI and Eastgate incident are very different because mine actually, you know, it went over the base very low. It went on the base, I should say. And so if something happened on base, because we did have um, non-munition, non-nuclear uh, bombs there, most of the other other bombs were over, the nuclear bombs were over at Bent Waters. And so, so Keith said, no, you report it. You're the lead patrol. And I'm thinking, oh, God. So I got on the radio and I started reporting it to the desk sergeant, the law enforcement desk sergeant. So I was going through official channels with this. I didn't just let it let it go. And Alan Cohen was the desk sergeant at the time. And he said, pretty much said, come again. Like, what? What are you talking about? Then he said, he said, Rafael, get on, get on the landline. Since we were right by East Gate. So I went, got out of the vehicle, went into the gate check and got on to the landline. And he told me to go. He said, well, what I want you to do is go to the air tower and see what they found. And I thought, well, that's good. That's good information. So at that point, I got back to the truck and we went down to the air tower. We climbed up to the outside. The uh, The way the air tower was set up, this stairway was on the outside, metal stairs. So we climbed up these stairs and uh, was knocking on the door. And the door was, it was a really heavy door. So when you knocked, you didn't think you were making any kind of an echo. Yeah. So then I just thought I started kicking the door to make, <laughs> to make some noise. I'm like, man, man. Finally, this guy, this airman answers the door and you could clearly see that he, that we woke him up. There was no doubt. And he then said, I told him what we'd seen and I asked him, did you see anything on your radar? Back then, the, the radar wasn't as high tech as it is now. I don't know. I really don't even know if they even had the ability to keep it recorded or keep anything recorded so yeah. you could look, you know, look back. And he said to me, he said, well, I think what you saw was uh, afterburners from an aircraft from the, from one of the other, the British bases. And all I could think about was, well, you know, when you see afterburners, you have uh, sonic booms. I mean, you, you just don't see that. And I mean, I've been at the base long enough to realize what, you know, what was what, and the aircraft would make mechanical sounds. I mean, you know, he, he just pretty much wanted to, I guess he wanted to go back to sleep. So did, you, I, did you hear, sorry, Laurie, did you hear any noise at all when no. you had this sighting? Was there any even feeling, you know, sometimes you hear about the kind of gravitational lensing or gravitational waves, or did you get any kind of pulsing through you or just to total silence? Total silence total silence. And now I'm, I'm walking, I'm on this platform because we have to walk up these stairs. So I'm heading back toward the stairs to go to my truck. And I'm looking out at the North Sea, thinking to myself, you know, how, how can, how can someone like me, by this point, I felt really beat up from the guys from the way they were treating me over the time, the, the years I was there. So I just felt like I knew where we'd get around and it'd be like, oh, Rayfield seeing UFOs, not Keith and Lori, but it was Lori. And so I'm looking out at the North Sea and what I didn't realize for a really long time is that the sky was actually, it was like daybreak. And now what happened was the sighting happened at, Zero three hundred hours. Is that where we were with the check sheet? So we lost, I would say, about two hours or more of time. You know, it's like one of those things where people say, you know, time flies, that kind of thing. Yeah, but something happened because we lost two hours of time. That there's no way it should have been. You know, the sky should be breaking open to daylight. 
And so we just kind of, but it was so subtle that, you know, we just kind of went on with what we were doing. And so there is a possibility that something happened within the two hours. And I don't know. Have you ever explored anything like, because obviously you're talking about missing time and potential. I mean, and the word people will be thinking of is some sort of abduction experience potentially, but many people don't remember what may or may not have happened in that time. Have you ever tried hypnotic regression to, to go back and find out about that missing time or any more about the experience? Yeah, I, I have actually talked to some people about it, but you know, some some people say, "Well, I'll, you know, give me two hundred dollars and I'll show you, you know, what we can do it." So I kind of figure that's something that if if somebody knows somebody reputable and they want me to do it, to, to, you know, I'm I'm open to the idea, but not not to. You know, not not to spend money out of my own pocket. Yeah, and listen, I'd be happy for any listeners. And there's people, I mean, much of the audience for this podcast is based out in the States, um, Mm -hmm. where you are as well. And if there was anyone who wanted to get in touch with Laurie, you can do that online or you can can get in touch with myself and I'll do that. If you knew someone reputable, credible, who wanted Mm -hmm. to assist in in that sort of um, field to kind of help Laurie potentially uh, recount recount the experience. So yeah, that would be great if someone could get in yeah. touch. Um, but of course, what about Keith himself? Did he speak about it much at the time? What was the conversation you had between you? Oh, um, with with Keith and I. Yeah. Uh, we we were just pretty much. Uh, we didn't know really what to say because because we did everything we could. We we felt like we we hit a dead end when by going to the. Uh, you know, going to the air tower. So, you know, there was nothing we could really do. I mean, it didn't leave any artifacts behind or didn't, you know, there was nothing that we could use to investigate it. Um, But I just felt like my responsibility was to report it due to if there was anything that, if anything had happened on the base or, um, you know, that I at, at least covered my butt and Keith's butt. So we, you know, we could at least say we did what we did. And it turns out many years later, the uh, Doc Rhodes, who who was one of my colleagues also, he was at the main gate and he saw, he actually saw the white light because he, in, in the same, because based on where he was standing, he could actually look out and toward the North Sea and he could see it too. Now, one of the worst kept secrets about the base is the fact that there seems to have been nuclear missiles or nuclear material mm. kept on the base. What was the talk around the time of incidents like yours, incidents like the Rendlesham Forest incident that happened in December, and these paranormal experiences have any, anything to do with what was being kept on base? Well, one of the other paranormal incidences that I had was... When I was actually working in the, uh, we called it the NMSA, which is a bomb gun over on Woodbridge, which really wasn't that far from from Eastgate. One night I was was there, and it was a really cold, rainy night, which is typical of England. And I pulled out my my building check sheet. And besides, I was going to walk around, um, check the buildings because we had to do it like every other, every two hours or every hour or something like that. And I, um, it was the midnight shift. So it, it was really dark there. And I'm walking toward the bunkers. And at that time, I got this flash. And this was before the UFO sighting. So, uh, so I got this flash in my mind. And it was a, it was this like eight foot mantid that uh, was very muscular, and he was pacing at the back of the back of the, the at the fence line, and he uh, pretty much the only thing I heard him say was "Don't go," and I figured he meant "Don't go in that direction because you know you're going to see a, uh, a mantid pacing back and forth." So I went back to my gate check and because it's just the thought of having to bump into a, a praying mantis giant just 
no, that, that, that one was too much to fathom. I mean, I, I, that was just something that I buried for a really, really, really long time because I didn't understand it. I just, you know, times like that, especially with this intuition thing, I sometimes, a lot of times I wish I didn't have it. You know, I'd rather sometimes ignorance is bliss. So I, uh, I let it go. But what was interesting is that at one point, maybe about two years earlier, they were actually renovating the NMSA when it was part of the weapons storage area at Woodbridge. And then someone made a decision. So they did all this work, but it wasn't above ground because above ground, it was just mounds with uh, doors on it. In this case, it was, uh, it had to have been inside the bunkers or somewhere, but not ground level up. And so they had moved the nuclear bombs after they renovated it for the nuclear bombs. They decided to move them over to Bentwaters. So that meant that, and the main reason they did that was because the, the fighter aircraft, the F-4s were leaving Bentwaters and we were starting to get the A-10s, different kind of aircraft. And so that was kind of a, a question that a lot of people had is why did they renovate the, uh, why did they put all this money into this non-munition, non-nuclear storage area? And, and I'm thinking it had something to do with this Nanted. I, I'm thinking that there was something more there in, in that location. And, uh, but I, I just, you know, you know, for, for years and years and years, I mean, I, I didn't know that much about ufology. You know, now, now people will tell me, oh, yeah, mantis, that's this, this, and this, and they're at the hierarchy of this, and, you know, the grays are down here, and these are up here. I'm thinking, you know, I didn't know. I mean, I guess maybe a part of me didn't want to know. And, you know, but again, talking when I was talking with Linda Moulton Howe, she told me that there were mantids there, too. So, so she kind of corroborated that. And, you know, and sometimes it feels really good when people corroborate what I feel or what I see or what I know, because, you know, you, you, because it's in the intuition part, you don't have, you don't have concrete facts there. Yeah. I've got a few questions I want to ask you. I'm, I'm going to follow up on that potential underground aspect to the base um, in the listener questions portion. Um, and one or two things just before we get to those listener questions, though, Laurie, because you've been great with your time so far. What do you want to accomplish sharing your story? Because you're not someone, that, someone that's gone out there looking to sell lots of books or get TV shows made about you or appear on mm-hmm. you know countless documentaries. You've just told your story. What do you want to accomplish sharing that story now, what, 40 years after the, the events? Yeah. Well, I've been actually sharing my story since actually about 1995, 96, when the story first came out. And I was part of the Disclosure Project in 2000 with uh, Stephen Greer. He was the first one that invited me. And the, the, the main reason is um, for a sense of, feeling not alone because other people have gone through something like this. And so for me, it's very cathartic to talk about it. Um, The other reason is the more I talk about it, the more I learn from others out there who can, who can share with me because I, because like many people, I'm on that quest to learn the meaning of life, to to understand the uh, sensitivity of intuition and how consciousness works and um, you could say I'm a very curious person and I'm interested in a lot of different things and and I, I truly believe that um, no I, I, I don't expect to get paid money and I'm not in it for I'm really not in it for the money um, because I'm fine I'm fine in that area so I'm not you know it's not like I'm hungry or I need to um, but I, I do believe that it's important because I'm a woman and I was a young woman at the time. It's kind of like I'm, I'm defending that young person who's probably Lori Rayfeld that's probably still there fighting, fighting this, you know, what, what's, what's out in that atmosphere there. 
How, how do you feel, Laurie, when you see other members of the military coming forward now and speaking about UFOs and UAPs, and particularly the, the female members of the military that are that are coming forward now? I I actually find that what they're going through, I can tell that there's still that discomfort to talk about it because again, it's not tangible even for for those uh, the pilots that have seen it. I mean, they could say they've seen it, they could have it on on radar or recorded, but the reality is is that they still don't know exactly what it is. I I think that a lot of people out there will want to dissect it, dissect everything to say, to say, well, this is it, you know, bring me some real proof um, with this back in June when they were doing that disclosure, you know, the government government was going to release all these documents. I, I was probably one of the few people I, I had no interest in it because I knew that they weren't going to share anything. I mean, anything substantial because I think a lot of them really don't quite know what's going on. And I think also that the uh, those who are, I would say, the UFO, the aliens or whatnot, it's they're not gonna they're not gonna come out and say we're here, this is what we're doing, blah blah blah. You know, keep in mind when you look at the world and the way we treat other human beings, how do you think we're gonna treat a living being that is from another world. Uh, our first reaction is to kill it or fear. Fear is a big one. And and they might be here for all benevolent reasons. They're probably the reason they're near nuclear bombs or places like that is because of their fear of what we could do to this earth. Uh, our, this earth probably has a lot of resources that other planets can use. And often that's that's the key to it is that until we get to the point where we can be loving and kind and generous, will we ever really get to meet these these aliens? I mean, even the aliens coming across Mexico, we make you know these human beings coming across, all we want to do is put them in jail or put them back in a bad situation. Um, so I really think that's probably some of the main reasons why we won't ever really see, we're not seeing these people, these UFOs. And I mean, if you look back at Roswell or the, those photos of people with the, with these dead aliens, you know, they're dissecting them. They're seeing, you know, well, they're dead. So let's look at what's inside their, their bodies or whatnot. Um, you know, we don't even treat animals right. So until until we get our act together, I think it's a it's a long road. Yeah, I can't I can't disagree with that, especially where we're at in twenty twenty one at the moment with uh, things that are going on in Afghanistan and other countries around the world. It's for people mm-hmm. to think that tomorrow there's going to be some form of global enlightenment seems a long long way away, given given where we're at as a species mm-hmm. ourselves. Laurie, I want to ask you one more question just before we get to listener questions. Would you have believed your story back then and and now if someone, if a young Lori Rayfelt had told you mm-hmm. about the sighting and missing time, how would you have reacted then and now to that story? Well, I, I put it this way is I realized when I was there, if Jesus Christ had come up to me and told me the meaning of life and what to do and whatnot, I would have to say, I'm sorry. I love you. However, you got to go to the public affairs office because no one's going to believe me. I have no credibility. Uh, most airmen have no credibility. What gave, what gave the uh, RFI credibility was, was Colonel Halt. And, you know, I mean, you got, you got a deputy base commander there who's like the second second or third person in the hierarchy of everyone on these two bases. Yeah. He's got, he's got the hierarchy. So I just felt that. Yeah. I mean, I, I knew that I had no, I didn't have credibility. Thanks. Laurie, let's get. Did that answer that question? Yeah. Yeah, it did. And I suppose I was asking as well, what about now, if you hadn't had those experiences, how do you think you may have reacted to, 
to again hearing about those types of events and ufos and you know a, a bright light breaking up into three pieces yeah. coming down yeah i i would actually have to listen to and, and look at the person talking and seeing where they're at i mean if i saw me saying it and, and my story hasn't wavered or changed i i would say that's got a lot of validity and that I'm, I'm not embellishing anything. So I would say that, you know, just looking at at me or, you know, others out there that have had the courage to come forward, you know, I would say, uh, you know, treat them with respect and, and listen to what they have to share because, you know, they, they are seeing something totally unusual that most people don't see. And I, I just think that... Uh, I would have believed me. I would have believed me, especially because it was just so painful to have to share it with it because I really did not, I didn't want to share it. And I, I would tell people that if I was there during RFI, chances are I would have said, we should be off base. You know, we need to call the the constables. We need to call them and have, have the off duty, have the, the police for that area go check out the sighting. I, you know, because that was out of our jurisdiction. And uh, yeah, so so I, yeah, if, if it's someone like me or someone, you know, the same thing comes across and straightforward and you, you can kind of tell that they're not excited or happy or eager to share it and they're not, you know, um, and they're not changing their story around. And then, then I would say, you know, you, you, I don't know, maybe it's an intuition thing. <laughs> maybe I would, let, believe, I would believe that Lori I would no that's a, I don't blame you listen let's get to some listener questions uh, Mark follows a couple of Facebook groups that I think you post on as well and mm -hmm. he said that recently you have stated there is still activity going on in Rendlesham Forest is that something you could expand on that is still happening there yeah yeah I uh well I, I was talking with one of the uh the director of Cable Green, and he um, he had witnessed some orbs out that way, uh, and right, bright red orbs that really scared the heck out of him. Um, and there's another gentleman, uh, Derek uh, Savoy, who, these, these guys are on my uh, Rendlesham Lone Ranger UFO site on Facebook, and I'm the Lone Ranger. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, and he he is really uh, Derek is is a quiet kind of guy, very, very uh, you know keeps himself, but he, he's he's right on the money when it comes to he'll go out in in the forest. They take photos, and they, they, you know these photos have all these different orbs and different things going on, and and he can feel the atmosphere there. I went to visit there in 20, uh, in, when was it, 2000, yeah, 2000, I went there, um, and I could still feel it. And, and that's why it's, it's not something new that's there. It's something that's been there, and it has probably something to do with the, uh, the Lee lines. It probably has something to do with some of the experiments they had done in and around the area, whether it was out by Bobsy Bay, different places like that. I think that they played around with uh, Einstein's theory of relativity. And I really think they blew a hole in the atmosphere and there's this negative energy pouring out into this area here, it, over there, at, uh, especially in and around Rendlesham Forest. And um, yeah, so I think it's a fascinating place if, if you're, you know, if you don't mind going out there in the middle of the night, you know, just, just to get a feel for what it was like or to think think of it. at the time when I was there, you could hear the foghorn in the, out in the North Sea and you could see the, the fog rolling in. And, and it's definitely, definitely a really, really creepy place. Yeah. And I think you mentioned Capel Green, which is a documentary that's been in production now for, for over a year. Uh, Gary mm -hmm. Heseltine. I believe would be uh -huh. the director. 
Um, yeah. I'm in touch with them and hoping when the time is right. I know there's been some delays mm-hmm. because of COVID and um, extra uh, CGI they were adding in for some scenes that were recreating. They want to get just right. So that's something that uh, we're looking forward to coming out in the hopefully the near future as well. And I'll be in touch with them for the podcast. Oh, too, yeah. So. Yeah. And there's also a film coming out uh, called Rendleton. It's going to be about, it'll be from, I think, uh, Colonel Halt's point of view. Uh, It's it's going to be a a feature film, kind of like a Hollywood kind of thing. Uh, I'm not sure exactly when. It's still in development. They have the screenplay and whatnot. Uh, But that's pretty pretty exciting, too. And they're actually, yeah, that... uh, that's exciting too. I would say with Cable Green, I think that there's a lot of heart in it. There's a lot of a lot of really good people. A lot of people came forward to share their stories, including me. And it's it's actually a story about the experiencers as opposed to about the researchers. And the, some researchers have been really putting it down and I, I kind of think that one day some of the researchers will probably get their they'll get what they deserve you know the people will will say no you you, you know you're lying they're telling the truth you know that kind of thing yeah the, hu- the human element of it um Ryan Sprague's <laughs> book is all about experiencers and people who have had sightings even Kevin Day who came forward uh, recently a few years ago now you know, it's people who have ordinary everyday lives, but something incredible has happened to them. And this has had some sort of impact, you know, emotionally, yeah. physically, or sometimes all of the above. So, so yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, something else Mark wanted to know about, Laurie, you touched on um, below ground at the base. Now, there's been, again, long rumoured to be tunnels around the base underneath. That would probably make sense if you're storing, you know, nuclear material and nuclear weapons. Mm-hmm. You, you said you've spoken to Linda Moulton Howe. What kind of conversations have you had about what may be underneath the base? Where you're potentially getting at the the idea that's housing some form of alien life? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah that that was that was pretty much the, the gist of it. I uh, now it's just a matter of me going out there with a shovel and <laughs> start digging. Um, yeah, I. I yeah, our conversation was was pretty much focused on the on the uh, the mantid, and you know, and then she decided she she didn't want to go down that road for some reason. Yeah, she pretty much just kind of cut me off. So I'm I'm not really sure, but she said there's a lot of there's a lot of history to that area, and, and that others have have said and experienced or witnessed um, these other beings. Uh, as your gut though as someone who has that intuition and someone who has been there it's one thing Linda Moulton how saying she's spoken to other people and having no evidence for it but you were there you you lived on the base for some time and you had experiences is that something you would subscribe to because it's still pretty incredible to think there may be right under your feet some other life forms either physically yeah. or or you know in a conscious state existing yeah, I, uh, I, you know, at the time, I never really, really thought about it. I mean, it, it didn't come to my mind to think about something underneath the um, the bases because it was old World War II facilities. But it wasn't until several years ago I was talking with Ken Kern, and he was the one that shared with me. He's also on on the uh, Rendlesham Lone Ranger page. He's one of my. He helps me out keeping the page from not going in a different direction. I, I kind of want to keep it on more or less research of what people find. And he came up with that piece of information that he actually worked at the weapon storage area at Woodbridge before they moved it, everything over to that water side. And I was there when they moved it over there because they had me standing on guard with an M16 and they say, if anybody comes over that hill, you shoot them. I'm like, okay. And I had to deal with would I really shoot somebody, you know, anyway. I'm glad you never had to. That you're Thank aware. You. That that you remember. Um, yeah. You never yeah. know what happened in that missing time. Um, listen, Dave had a question. Do you think the American personnel who experienced the Rendlesham event were, were aware of the other paranormal activity at the base that you've talked about? Uh, 
I don't think they were aware of like the mantid that I experienced or um, I experienced the gray at in the right behind me at the at the gate shack at East Gate. And then I experienced uh, seeing the ghost of Colonel Thompson, who was a uh, he was one of the pilots that actually died in a uh, in an air show. I think it was at Chick Sands, RF Chick Sands. What a lot of people talk about was more or less the the stories were the woman on the bicycle, the faceless woman on the bicycle that will one one of one of these guys was driving a metro van where it didn't have any windows on on the side. So all these guys would be sitting inside this this box kind of van. And the only one who could see out was the driver. And the driver shared with me once that that yeah, he had an experience where he looked out and he could see this woman on a bicycle. And then he started to then he looked out, he was looking at his the mirror the side mirror and he could see that she was keeping pace with him and she's on an old bicycle. And then he noticed she didn't have a face. And that's, he said, it's scared, scared that out of them. Yeah. And he, he started driving really fast. So this is on between East gate, the back gate and to the back gate of, uh, of Bentwaters, which would take you through Butley. We called it the Butley gate. And he started, he said he was driving, he sort of dropped 50, 60 miles an hour. I mean, he was pushing this thing. And no one in the back knew what was going on, but he'd look out and he was going 50 miles an hour. And this, this woman on this bicycle without a face is keeping pace with him. And so, and I've heard some other people share similar stories. And I'm just like, that's really, really, I'm really glad I didn't see her. That would have probably would have really blown me away. Yeah, I'm I'm good with I'm good with UFOs and aliens, but when it comes to uh, ghosts, it's a shiver down the spine for me. I'm not very good watching ghost movies. But um, yeah. listen, I think listeners' ears would have pricked up when you mentioned you experienced a grey, and mm-hmm. it would be remiss of me on a podcast called That UFO Podcast not to dig in a little bit deeper about that. What was the experience you had with the grey? Yeah, I was sitting in the gate shack, and it was about again three o'clock in the morning, something like that. That number three. Yep. Yeah, 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 three. And and I just felt I just felt it him behind me. And when I realized it uh, a long time ago, I, if I'm sitting in the gate shack and, and he's behind me and um, he's somewhere, he had to have only been about maybe three, four feet tall something like that. And he had the big gray head, but I, I saw him again through my mind and he told me not to turn around because he didn't want me to be scared. So, you know, I, I was really tired. So I said, I don't care. <laughs> like, I don't care. I'm not looking though. Because uh, the last thing you need to do is we had, we had, we had guys who would actually, one guy shot off his weapon while he was out there on, on East gate. And, and I got a phone call. I was on the back gate of, of, Bentwaters, the Butley Gate, and they said, Rayvel, what are you doing? Are you shooting your weapon off? And I'm like, no. And he, the desk sergeant hung up, and then we found out later that it was the, the airmen on Eastgate. And we, we had a lot of airmen go through extreme situations to get out of the base, to get off base. And, um, yeah, it, it was just a, a real waste that we had a lot of young airmen that were eager to please and do a good job and the whole thing. And next thing you know, they're, they're being kicked out. And Dave also had a follow up on that. And what is your best guess at what the origin of this phenomenon is? Good question. I I think it has to do with, like I mentioned, it's a combination of the history of the place I mean, you'd have to probably almost go back thousands of years. There's a high, the, the energy level at, at that area, the lead lines that intersect it um, has something to do with it. And the, you know, and the fact that it's actually in alignment with uh, the, uh, like the pyramids and the Bermuda Triangle. I mean, it's interesting when you start realizing that all these places have, that are, are connected. And so it's, um, yeah, I, um, 
I, I just kind of think it was that. I, and I also think the experiments that they had done, Cobra Miss, some of the experiments in, um, do radar jamming to create in, in, um, aircraft to be invisible. I think playing around with that and uh, that particular exercise, uh, um, not exercise, that particular experiment ended up causing a high pitch sound that they realized didn't come from internal, didn't come from the equipment. So instead of trying to pursue what happened, they dismantled it. And they still have the rays out there too, out by the um, the North Sea. You can actually see where where the uh, like the Cobra Mist was set up. But people can say a lot of things as for what happened, you know. And you know, I just kind of think when you've got this accumulation of stuff going on and it's been happening for many, 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 many years, and then you've got witchcraft going on and druids and and you know um, that whole activity, it start to make sense that why it, it wouldn't be a hot spot for UFOs and para- paranormal. And finally, Dave from Shadows of Your Mind magazine asked, "What are your thoughts on Larry Warren's version of events about Rendlesham? Uh, since a lot of the information he talked about has come out as being fabricated or not true." Well, I'm really glad. I'm really glad someone asked that question because Larry and I, our time together intersected briefly. He got there around December first, and I was counting my days down. Literally, and I had a little piece of paper I kept in my pocket, and I would cross it off each day. And the one thing about Larry is that he was the first one. He never gave up. Um, he never get, gave up pursuing the story while he was there. When he was there, people told him to shut up, shut up, shut up. And he wouldn't quit. And then they started really, really not treating him, uh, treating him pretty badly. And he, I think he finally got fed up and said he didn't, he wasn't doing the job he was intended to do. And they gave him this deal where you can go and um, get out because you're not doing the job you intend to do. But I think it was a loophole that that uh, Major Zickler was using to, to get them out because he learned later on he he had a code on his DD Form 214 that said he couldn't come back in. Um, so I personally have read Left Eddie State that he wrote, and he was the reason why it was like I was asleep for many, many years because I didn't know it came back. I left December 15th. And when I was typing in net state, it came across left at East Gate. And, I'm, and so this is about 1996. And I'm thinking, oh my God, why are they talking about East Gate? I mean, this is like a little minute, tiny place in the, in the planet. And it really got me into a position where I was really, really, the Lori Rayfeld that was there in 1980, who was pretty much marginalized and told to shut up. And, I, you know, I was very obedient and I did shut up that I wanted answers. I wanted answers to know what was going on there. And, and you know, because I, I felt like throughout the decades, that was the worst assignment I ever had because it was just a distress level. Everything about the base, uh, everything mm-hmm. about it was just, it was just too much. It was like everything was off. And he noticed that in one of his chapters, he mentioned about getting to the base and he, he, he noticed it was off a bit. Now he, um, his story is right on the money. And a lot of people have been examining his documents or examining different things. But, you know, personally, I really think that um, he's had, he's had some infighting with some of his old friends or something. And, and for some reason they want revenge and whatnot. And I, I, you know, that's between him and his friends, but personally, what I think what they did to him, what Nick Pope did to him to stoke the fire, they all did to him was, was criminal. I really think that to defame him the way they did after he was one of the first people to actually stick his neck out in the, in the 1980s. Um, you know, I, I just kind of think he's a human being. 
he makes mistakes. However, I really think that all the stuff that they were talking about was embellished or if, if he was in a moment of desperation, I doubt, you know, I can't talk about, I don't know. Um, but you know, what he did in his personal life shouldn't reflect, I think, on what he, what he's done getting the word out about this UFO because his whole sighting has been a part of his life. He's highly intelligent. He's very, very thoughtful and he's got his story to share and we have the right to, to listen to it. When I was listen, watching one of the shows uh, recently, uh, somebody had videotaped one of the conferences and to give you an example, and it had, uh, it had say Nick Pope in it and Nick Pope showed a picture of the East Gate on it. And when I was watching it, I'm like, that's not the East Gate that we all know. So in many ways, you're getting some dis bad information from people who are calling themselves researchers. So I truly believe that what makes them better or worse than, uh, than Larry. Uh, I, I just think that Larry is a human being. He's, you know, he's got his, he's got his issues. I have my issues. You have your issues. You know I mean? None of us are, you know, are perfect, but I don't believe that what he's written, I mean, it matches too much up to my story, too much, because I was there for two and a half years. So, so if anyone knows what was going on there for the, especially if you're sensitive to the environment there, I mean, my mom even picked it up. She got, she came to visit me for two weeks and she said, I got to get you the hell out of here. <laughs> she said, something's wrong with this place. I mean, my mom felt it. And I just think that um, what's happened with him, he needs to get his word out. He needs to share his story to continue sharing it. He's, he's done so much for ufology and for people to turn on him. It's just to me, you know, you might not like him as a guy, but, you know, his, his information is right on the money. Peter Robbins may, may have changed his mind. That's his personal thing, but... Um, I just think that it's time to quit beating up on uh, um, on people that have experienced, you know, what we experienced. Yeah, and that was the essence of why they came up with Capel Green is because yeah. this story is legitimate. No, some interesting thoughts there, Laurie. I do appreciate that. Um, Laurie, how can people follow you? And you've mentioned the Facebook page. How can they um, keep in touch with you as well? Yeah, they can also reach me on that on my Twitter site at Lori L O R R. I think there's four R's. I I'll, e I'll put the I'll put the link okay. in the description okay. so people can yeah because it's got a few yeah, R's in yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, a lot of times sharing the story, it, it's usually can, can take me almost two hours to go through it because the, of, of the experience. And some days I'm really on, and and today I'm. I kind of feel like I'm a little bit off, but I do apologize for that. No, it's been good. Um, okay. Uh, and you, you mentioned the Facebook page as well. What was the name of the Facebook page if people want it's, to join uh, the group? It's the Rendlesham Lone Ranger UFO site. Now, the thing that's interesting about it, they'll say, well, why Rendlesham, why Lone Ranger? And it's because I was on John Burroughs and Jim Penniston's page, the uh, – was it justice for the 81st security police squadron of 1980 and you know wanting to know about what happened during that time and i joined the page because my sighting happened in 1980 but it happened it was precursor it happened 1980 uh february so you know it was like i'm an adult there are adults and anyway, John apparently kicked me off the page because I wanted to talk about something that was outside of RFI. And, and that's key. If I have anything to leave with anybody, it is got to look at all the pieces. And there's a whole lot of pieces out there. And I just think that um, that's why I bring up my story so that I can hear other people bring in other pieces. Say, yeah, you know, we're right because I had this thing happen or I had something else happen that was similar. 
Um, you know, I, I mean, that's the way I learned about Lee lines and that's where I learned about all these different, you know, um, like there's a relationship between over not far from RF Woodbridge is this place called Sutton Who, And they've got these mounds that are in the shape of uh, Ple- Pleiades of the star cluster, kind of like the Subaru, what we drive. And there's another place called the Zone of Silence in in Mexico that propped up in that cropped up in one of my dreams, and they've had these uh, Pleiades people there too. So there's there's a lot of connections that come through dreams and different things like that, and you know these are again other pieces that that are all together, and there's a relationship between what happened also as far back as like Atlantis, you know, where, you know, where we're getting a lot of the information, you know, we find, um, I find that when I was about 10 years old, I, uh, I wanted to see the film chariot of the gods. It was, it was like, I wasn't much into documentaries, but for some reason I was really wanting to understand what was going on with, you know, with, how things end up where they are. And so, so this is part of that pursuit of wanting to get these pieces together. And it doesn't have to be my story. It, it, it needs to be shared, it needs to be a shared story. And, and so, like, you, okay. like you say, the, the Eastgate incident, it's, it's your story, but it's Keith's story and others' story. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's a piece of the puzzle. And you're all, you're all part of that, aren't you? That uh, what's went on at Rendlesham and hopefully people listening to you, Laurie mm-hmm. here are, um, are able to kind of pick up on a new part of that story and, and kind of take that forward as well. So uh, it's been lovely speaking with you. I've had a, a great time and I hope to hear okay. you on other podcasts and shows as well, sharing your story again so more and more people can hear it. Well, if you ever want me back, I'm, I'm here for you too. That is all for this week's show. Thank you very much for listening. Please remember to leave the podcast a review on your chosen platform. You can like, retweet and subscribe. That would all be very much appreciated. The shows are being uploaded onto YouTube as we speak more and more. You can sign up at patreon.com forward slash that UFO podcast to access the shows ad free as well. Please get in touch on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, that UFO podcast. Of course, on Twitter, it's at UFO, U-A-P-A-M. And again, folks, as always, keep looking up. You never know what you might see. It wasn't a tic-tac and not quite a saucer, more like a hubcap designed by Chaucer. A little Baroque and quite steampunk, like Alice was playing bass for the Parliament of Fuck. The little fucker hovered right outside of my window, and when I shoved out the screen, he made it an issue. I don't think he expected me to see his ass, but I'd had some champagne and smoked a little more ass. Meditative game of fate full on meta. I can't imagine how it could have been any better. I got to the top of the stairs and there he was. I'm like, you're awake? I was about to abduct you, cuz. back and nearly kissed myself and I climbed out the window after the elf and I woke up in my bed and there was something on my head and everything was weird and everything was red. I called out to my boys, they thought this was noise, they thought it was a dream, they thought it was my toys, they thought it was my problems and they think I should take care of me and I don't know what it is because it doesn't really scare me.